Once again, we are uh, talking to an, another author. I've an interviewed a number of them. Uh, and this one has to do with a, a series of children's books. Now, the copies that I have of this series, these are the Stardust series. And I have uh, Stardust Explores Earth's Wonders, Stardust Explores the Solar System, Stardust Explores... Do I have Earth's Wonders twice? I do. I have Earth's Wonders twice. I hear I thought I, I'm going to have to go find where my other book is. Anyway, today I'm talking with uh, Ariel Marcy, and you're a PhD candidate, yes? That's right. All right, what is your field? So I study evolutionary biology, and I'm Ooh. focusing on Australia's awesomely weird mammals, because there are so many of them here. Very, very good. And so what is your relationship to the Stardust series? Yeah, so I cannot claim to be an author of those books, um, because that um, honor goes to Bailey Harris, who is now 14, but she started them when she was eight. And so she's an amazing science communicator, making books specifically for kids to learn about different aspects of science. And so I actually met her because her latest book, The Stardust Explores Earth's Wonders, is about geology and evolution. And as an evolutionary biologist, uh, she asked me to just make sure that the content was correct and made sense and uh, presented the latest research. And so I was very excited to do that. And I worked with uh, her for about a year um, in the process of making that book. And over the course of that time, uh, we decided to make a game together. So I'm a game designer and her family loves my game Go Extinct. And together we're making a new version of that game all about uh, kittens and puppies, as you said at the top of the show. <laughs> okay, so I have a copy also of that board game layout. And I read a review of this game that was posted on somebody else's channel, and they described it as being very similar to Go Fish, or that it seems to be based on that concept. And here's some associated stuff that comes with that game. Um, I've never played Go Fish. <laughs> um, so I, I don't have any idea what to even compare it to. So maybe you can explain how, how does this game work? How do you play it? Yeah, totally fair. So Go Fish is a set collecting game that is very simple, so much so that kids like five or six can play it because all you're doing is asking other players, do you have any twos? And if they have twos, then they have to give one to you. And once you get all four twos from the deck of a normal playing card, then you get a set and that helps you win. Now Go Extinct takes that very simple mechanic that's very familiar, which means it's really easy to learn, takes that mechanic and applies it to an evolutionary tree. Now one of the hardest concepts to teach are related to reading evolutionary trees is the idea of a clade, which you know is all of the animals or organisms that descended from one common ancestor. And that kind of, that's a set. And so in Go Extinct, all you are doing is collecting sets of closely related animals that complete one of those clades. And so you have this very friendly board that's color coded to help you do that. And the cards are color coded. So you're, you're making the association to the animal and how it's related to other things as you're playing. And so organically as you play using this very simple set collecting mechanic, uh, you're learning how to read an evolutionary tree, which is a foundational skill for biologists. And it was very handy for me in understanding a lot of things. I mean, it's amazing to me that other people don't automatically see the correlation. I mean, if you if you have a goat, a cow, and a dog, you know, play the Sesame Street game, you know, one of these things is not like the other, right? I mean, how easy is it? What I what I find is that everybody wants to just do dichotomies. So you can put two of anything. It doesn't matter how similar they are. You can always find a difference between two. If all you've got is two, you can always find a difference between them. But when you've got three, the dynamic completely changes. And now you have to admit that these two are closer and this one's not part of that. Or, you know, the difference is more for one than the other two. And it's always that. It's just always that way. Yep. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I was inspired to make the game because I didn't do a very good job about teaching evolutionary trees to university students. Um, that concept was so difficult to get across. And I think one of the reasons is that it's um, not exactly linear when you're thinking about sets within sets within sets where like, you know, humans are primates 
but we're also mammals and we're also vertebrates and each one of those categories gets bigger and more inclusive. Um, so the game format helps people practice that concept uh, by repeating I could, I could over see, and over. I could see how a game could help uh, help cement that concept. I never saw the difficulty in that. Now, I, I can't claim superiority because you know I, I'm <laughs> taking a statistics class right now, and it's just I, I feel like a special ed student trying to walk through statistics. Some things I can understand, some things I have difficulty with. I guess we're all that way. But it just it just made sense to me that when you look at like theropod dinosaurs, for example, and you look like and you look at birds, <laughs> right? And then let's say look at bats. Well, okay, well. Well, again, <laughs> the birds and dinosaurs are much closer together than, you know, anyway. Yeah, but it's actually kind of an amazing fact. I think a lot of people don't know how to look at a trait and figure out the most important part. Like they look at wings between bats and birds and they're like, oh, well, those must be related. And I mean, you can, you can sort of forgive them for that mistake, but once you look, once you remind them, hey, actually look at the structure of the arm, that's when you really see the difference. And that's when you get to talk about convergent evolution. And I think that's really exciting. And that's the kind of thing evolutionary trees help you see you know, when you know, things so converge. So Harry, Harry S. Seeley, I think it was, who suggested that birds evolved not from dinosaurs, uh, or from pterosaurs, as a couple of other people were trying to suggest once upon a time, uh, he suggested that they evolved from sea turtles. Wow, okay. That's because creative. sea turtles used their forelimbs as flippers, which he thought could be modified into wings. And of course, turtles have beaks. And the strange huh. thing about that is that all of these classifications that were done in the 19th century, and, and a lot of people still today, are doing the classifications on the surface features not the core structure, yeah. Which, which is the amazing part. I mean, because what resemblance is there between a turtle and anything else, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but certainly a dinosaurs to birds. So when you take that the Linnaean tree of life and, and you, you, you take anything and you say, okay, well, then this is a, uh, this is technically it's it's a it's a mammal. Well, if it's a mammal, then it also falls into the vertebrate category, and if it's a vertebrate, it also falls into the animal category, and so it has to fall into these parent categories just by default. But then there are there's obviously things where you know, where all of these things are in these same categories together until suddenly they're in different branches. It's a branching tree pattern, and people want to deny that that exists, but it exists. <laughs> It's yeah. pretty easy to confirm, but I, but I, I can't get get past people that they only look at the surface features. I got into an argument once with a, with a believer once upon a time who said that mm -hmm. octopuses should be classified as ink pens since they produce ink, and they should be classified as spiders since they have eight legs. Huh. Just no concept at all of of you know homology or or embryology or any of that. They're just no, no semblance of understanding whatsoever. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say to that. Other than <laughs> we need we need more resources to help make <laughs> evolutionary trees just um, approachable. And I think, um, especially when we're talking about people um, with belief, I think anything in evolution feels scary because it threatens something that's important to them, and the thing with evolutionary trees is that it doesn't matter what you believe, it's true for you. And you can take that and learn something from it. And I hope that things like games, which are friendly, um, can be appealing to people who might not consider evolutionary trees just because they have um, a preconceived notion about what evolution is. Yeah, and it's, an, it's always a very wrong uh, notion. And whenever I get into arguments with creationists, they can never tell me what evolution is. They, they always tell me that some weird, bizarre parody that nobody ever taught, you know, where, 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 some, where, where one thing gives birth to another fundamentally different thing that's so fundamentally different that it can't even be related to its ancestors. Obviously, the evolution never taught anything like that. What we're talking about is population genetics. You know, and we've been using these principles throughout agriculture, throughout the history of agriculture. So it would be a good idea to understand how it works. Yeah, uh, definitely. I would think. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that some of that comes from the misconception of evolution as a ladder of progress, which, you know, some of the images that we frequently use to sort of denote evolution like that, you know, the, the ape slowly standing up, that's wrong. And it's, you know, evolution is not something that happens to an individual animal. It's something that happens, like you say, to a population. I think that makes it much easier to understand how, you know, populations can split, which is why we have humans and we still have monkeys. And yeah, that's, um, I have to use the analogy of languages quite often. Oh, that's a great idea. People, people understand that there was never a first guy to speak French. It's not like you're walking around a bunch of Latin speakers and suddenly you speak French. And now you've got to go find somebody to speak French to, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is, this is to explain the population level of it. Cause so it's, it's amazing how people don't get this. Yeah. And, and again, I can't, there are other subjects that I, that I wrestle with just as hard. It's just, I don't happen to wrestle with this one. So I want to help people understand this one. Definitely. So g give us a little, give us a little bit more about the game. What makes it fun? What makes it interesting? Uh -huh. What was, you know, all that. Well, I can talk about this for as long as you want, but I'll keep it short. So uh, what makes a game fun is also what makes it a good learning game. So because I was telling you earlier, you're collecting sets of closely related animals, what we scientists call monophyletic clades. So that's all of the animals that connect to one common ancestor. You can ask for anything on the tree. So instead of in Go Fish, you, you can just ask for twos or you can just ask for kings or whatever you can get to ask for, you could ask for the chicken if you're collecting dinosaurs, or you could ask for any dinosaur. And that could include any of the four animals in that clade. And what's good about that in a game is that when you ask for a less specific category, you're sneakier. You give less information away. So that makes you... <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> That's okay. Understanding a really important point here, which is that if you ask for more inclusive clades, so those larger categories, then you have a larger probability of getting something helpful to you while giving less information away about your hand. Now, as a game designer, I need to balance that. There can't just be one strategy. So the other uh, rule that makes it really fun is that if you've been listening really closely, and kids love to do this, you know, they're constantly like listening to what their friends are asking for and trying to trying to figure out what they have in their hand. If you ask for a specific animal like the chicken and you get it, then you get to ask again. And that's really fun because if you figured out what someone has, you get to steal their entire clay away from them. Um, and that feels very satisfying and makes ramps up the competition a bit and uh, makes it fun to play again. Now in this uh, go fish concept, you know, and you say, do you have any twos? And the person that has the two has to give it to you. Yeah, well, you have to ask one specific person. That's important. You have to, you have to decide who you think has the card you want. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. An important distinction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else? So the, I think the other thing that makes it fun is actually the biology. And some of that is I try to do... Um, games that include organisms that represent a whole bunch of different places on Earth. And that means that, you know, kids from the States, there's going to be animals they're very familiar with, as well as animals that they're less familiar with. And so they're going to be realizing that, for example, um, just to keep with the chicken example, that chickens are very closely related to dinosaurs. And a lot of kids don't realize that they've been eating dinosaurs this whole time. And that is like one of their number one favorite facts for the original game. And now with the, the new game that we're putting out with um, cats and dogs, we're really excited for people to see how their pets are related to each other. So if they have both of those animals, they can see that they, they sort of exist on two different branches of the carnivore tree. And they'll make some surprising realizations. It's like hyenas are not dogs. They're actually more related to cats. And doesn't that put Lion King in a new interesting evolutionary light? So it's, it's trying to convey with the game that the evolutionary tree is a story generator and you get to choose your own adventure. It's kind of like Dawkins ancestors tale where you can decide, okay, how do these two animals that exist now, where is their common ancestor? And what went different when those populations split 
to make them look different or look similar. And that's, that's what scientists do. Looking at just the clade of carnivorans, you know, people that ask mm -hmm. for a transitional species, you don't even have to look in the fossil record. I mean, although there is a hell of a fossil record for transitional carnivorans, there's so much mm -hmm. weird stuff in there. I mean, dog bears and bear dogs and, yeah. and weasel dog bears and <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, all these undifferentiated things, you know, where it's, yeah, but there are also still things that are alive today that most Americans are not aware of, you know, things like mm -hmm. civets. Yeah. For example, you know, the 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 um the binturong or the bear cat, right? So mm -hmm. I was talking about bear dogs and dog bears and now bear cats. <laughs> Shut up. Wants <laughs> 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 to be included. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of things that are like um the fossa, for example, which is a uh, on first on, on on a superficial inspection, and this is unfortunately the way a lot of people do things is they look superficially. What does it look like on the surface? It looks like a cat, right? So they decide that it is a cat, but internally, it's not quite a cat. It's very very close, not quite a cat. It's just outside yeah. of cat. And so how do you <laughs> classify that? And then you have things that are like just outside a dog, <laughs> yeah. and then you know going back into the fossil record, as I said, you know when you have like myosids and and, and gannets. That we still have, you know, still today, where you, where you like this is, this is a catish, quasi gonna be cat, <laughs> very very transitional, I think. So anybody looking for transitional yeah. species don't need look no further than you know civets and gannets and that sort of thing. All right, I'm gonna let you uh, make yeah. uh, whatever closing argument because we wanted to tie this up at about twenty minutes. So um, sure, yeah. Go ahead and present what you will. Sure. So right now we are running a Kickstarter campaign to get this new Go Extinct Stardust edition all about the evolution of cats and dogs and their beautiful relatives on Kickstarter. It's live now. You can search for it with those keywords, um, I'm sure. And we'll put a link. Um, the reason why I think it's great is that it's combining both a book and a game in a way to communicate science in a new way or in complementary ways. So this, So the book itself really gives a coherent linear story that you can follow. You can connect big concepts like geology to evolution to the evolutionary tree. And then the game allows you to practice those skills and specifically the skills <laughs> that you have <laughs> Shut up! everywhere <laughs> want you to learn. <laughs> Somebody showed up at the door, and of course, that sets the dog off. That's right. So support it for science uh, communication, and especially for education for kids. That's my pitch. OK. All right, Ariel, uh, thank you very much for being on for this. And, and I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I have two of the same book. I knew that I had, I knew that I had one double, but I thought I had another one to present here. And uh, I'm kind, I'm quite impressed with the the young author starting out, you know, at eight. Yeah. Uh, how how does she um, how did how does she deal with being an author? Uh, gosh, I think she would be the best spokesperson on that. Um, but she really shines when she speaks, and uh, you can watch her at uh, Skepticon recently. Um, and that she she met uh, Richard Dawkins there, one of her heroes. Um, so I think uh, knowing that she is bringing a message about science that is true and that everyone can understand is one of the motivations that she has. And that's that's what I understand from her. But I think you should definitely ask her. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm very supportive of that. All right, Ariel. Uh, thank you for presenting all this to us. Um, we'll go thank ahead you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Good luck to you. Best of. Thank you.